Good to be here tonight. Like I say, we spent probably most of the afternoon. Uh, I tweeted out the picture of our setup up there. And uh, of course, we have that camera there. That's a movable camera. You can, uh, we've had that one for years. So that's control from upstairs. That'll zoom, turn, whatever. This one stays fixed. And we've got another camera. And we're probably going to set it up maybe over there, something like that. And just kind of get a little bit, just upgrading the video. Already, I think the video looks better. Um, I was checking out the stream on Facebook uh, before I came out here, and I could already see a difference. Of course, I kind of know what I was, I kind of know what I didn't like about it before. So, uh, making some improvements on that and some improvements on the audio. Um, now, you'll be able to hear the pulpit mic, which you couldn't hear that before. Um, and some of the other stage mics, you'll be able to hear those. We have this wireless mic. It's directly fed into the video. It doesn't even come out through there anymore because we don't need it. You can hear me, right? Ronnie, you can hear me? Okay. Um, and then this room mic, for sure, we have running straight into there. And if I can figure out another way to get that room mic fed into it, we've only got four audio ports, but uh, there might be a workaround for that. But anyway, we don't need the room mics coming out over the speakers. Just don't need it. So anytime somebody was talking and Michael wanted to turn the mic sound up, well, that gave us feedback over the speakers. So we bypassed that. So now anybody talks in here and like they have a prayer request or a testimony want to be heard, uh, that's fed directly into the video feed as well. It bypasses that speaker up there. So me and Michael made the mess and Jeremy cleaned it up for us. He's good at it. You ought to have Jeremy come straighten your house up. He's amazing. I'll hire him out. Okay. All right. Uh, take your Bible. Turn to Matthew 17. Um, if you remember, several weeks ago, a couple months ago, uh, God laid it on my heart to preach a series of messages on prayer and fasting. And because that's a lot of where our spiritual warfare is going to be. And lo and behold, we had so many problems with the internet and with the streaming and recording that almost none of it got recorded. Almost none of it. So I said, I'm going to redo that. So that's what we're going to start on tonight is um, a multi-part series on prayer and fasting, what it involves, what it doesn't involve. And those of you who are here, you say, well, I've already heard this. If you were online, you didn't, you didn't hear most of it, I guarantee you. So, but we want to get it out, not only for those who are watching live stream, but for the teaching value of it is as well. There is a lot that's out there on the internet about prayer and fasting that I think is just an outright lie. And then it gets into what I call ritualism. And I just don't go for ritual. I don't think rituals impress God. I don't think they do. I think when you start getting into rituals like I'm facing this direction and I'm saying these words with my hands held out like this. Some of you who used to be Catholic, you know what I'm talking about. Why do they got to hold their hands out like this? Why do they got to do that? Why do we have to do this every time I say something? That's not anywhere in the scriptures. So uh, there's a lot out there when it comes to ritualism and especially prayer and fasting as a ritual. I think is a I think it's a lie because God is not impressed. Fasting is about denying the flesh. But there's so much that people use fasting as a way to boast about what they're not doing, if that makes sense. I'm not eating today. That makes me more spiritual with God. I don't think it works that way. So anyway, uh, let's get into the teaching. Let's have a word of prayer tonight. We'll go over our prayer request here in a little bit. Uh, Sister Linda Toomey finally, finally made it out of the hospital. She's home doing well. So uh, keep her in your prayers. Pray for Sister Bonnie. Um, pray. Boy, I'd like to send some missionaries to Beirut, Lebanon. And um, so, but just pray for those people over there. Pray for our country. 
Father, we come before you tonight. We thank you, God, for a good day. Thank you, Lord, for beautiful weather. Thank you, Father, for everything you've done for us. Lord, we understand there's not anything. Father, I know there's not anything that I've ever done that's in my flesh that has drawn your attention or that has pleased you. So, Father, help us, dear God, to understand this teaching right. Help us to understand the value of what your word tells us to do. Insight, Father, that we may never had before. Teach us, dear God, whether we pray and fast or we just pray. Teach us to pray. Teach us how to reach heaven. We thank you, God, that when we are at our best, you hear us. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that when we are at our worst, you still hear us. So, Father, thank you for your word tonight. Pray to be a blessing to each and every one that's here and each and every one, Father, that is joining with us online. Maybe they have questions. Pray to God that you would answer those questions. Bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. What I have up on the screen, Matthew 17, 21, Mark chapter 9, verse 29. I want you to open up to these two verses. And if you have not done so already, and this would be for you and this would be for the people at home, I want you to underline those verses, and then I want you to make a note in your Bible and say, missing verses. Because these two are. One of them is missing entirely. The other one, I can't remember which is which, but the other one is cut off. Where Jesus says, this kind goeth not out but by prayer. And leaves out the and fasting part. And we're going to read the context. I don't think I did this first time I preached this. We're going to look at the two stories, Matthew 17 and Mark 9. And my personal opinion is I don't think they're both talking about the exact same story. I think they're talking about two different instances. But we'll find out. Matthew 17, verse 21. Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. And we'll look at the context of that in a minute. Mark 9, 29. And he said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. So now I want us to go to Matthew chapter 17. Let's get the whole context of it. Let's kind of back up and get the story of what, uh, what led up to this. What was it that the disciples could not do because they had not prayed and fasted? We start in verse 14. The Bible says, and when they were come to the multitude... There came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic. Something that I've said often about both of my sons. <laughs> Lunatics like their dad. And sore vex. What do you think that means, lunatic? What do you think that means? What do you think that implies? Okay. Uh, it's possible. Now. Does that mean that everybody with who is mentally challenged, mentally handicapped, uh, brain damage, autism, does that mean that it's a simple matter of casting a devil out and they're going to be fine? No, I don't think it means that at all. We know, we know for a fact there were people in the Bible in Jesus' day, and I believe now, who probably were possessed of devils and were sick as a result of it, you cast the devil out, and the person becomes whole again. My thing is, I think the presence of a devil inside of somebody is not good on their physical body. Okay? That's what I think. I think the presence of a devil or a group of devils, as in the case of Legion, we know, they were in the, we know the man named Legion wasn't in his right mind. He was living in the caves where they kept dead people. He was running around naked, no clothes on, and he had superhuman strength, okay? And he cried and howled and wailed all night long like an animal. So definitely it had an effect on his mind. But I don't think that someone who is full of devils or has a devil in them, I don't think it's good for their physical body, okay? So we know that God can heal every disease. We also know that God doesn't heal every disease, in this life he will in the next one amen guaranteed but not in this life so it's i think it's something to remember when it's when it says lunatic 
I think of the word Luna, means moon. And I think it's very possible that this young man was full of a night spirit. Remember on Genesis, on day four of, in uh, Genesis chapter one, God created two lights. The greater light to rule the day, less the light to rule the night. Who rules the day? Christ. We are children of the day. Who rules over the darkness? Prince of the power of the air. The moon is represented by that. The moon is a light bearer. A Lucifer, literally. Okay? So I think it has <clears throat> that kind of meaning there. But anyway, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples and they could not cure him. <clears throat> then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Suffer means allow you or put up with you. Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil and departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your what? Unbelief. For verily I say unto you, you have faith as a grain of mustard seed. And how big is that? Smallest of the seeds. You shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. By the way, can you think of something in the Bible where a mountain is taken out of its place and cast into something else? Where is that? Where is that? Revelation. Revelation. God's going to take Babylon the great caster into the sea, okay? Um, it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible to you. How be it? There is an exception. This kind, he said, goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. That's one witness to tell you that a lot of things that we need done can be done by prayer alone. Asking God, you know me, if it's simple, that's Christianity. I believe in the simplicity that is in Christ. Paul warned us about anybody who would remove you from that simplicity. And I have, I've read all kinds of stories where people said they went to a certain, um, um, uh, what's the word? Spiritual warfare expert, someone who cast out devils or someone who did spiritual warfare, took them through all kinds. One guy, I'm not going to mention the name, don't want to embarrass the guy, he's still alive. But he was outed, he was a prominent gospel singer and was outed as a homosexual. He didn't want to be. And so there was some guy that got involved in his life and took him through some ritual, he Made him take a crucifix and hug the crucifix and he had to cry for hours and, you know, say, I don't want this and cast this out in Jesus name. And all, he was naming all kinds of devils to get out of him, stuff like that. And uh, I don't know if it worked. I didn't follow up, but I just I don't know. I think if you want something bad enough, you'll ask God, you'll ask God, you'll ask God, you'll ask God. And God will either do it or give you better than what you asked for. And you'll accept that. Amen. So, but there are occasions where things must be handled a little bit differently. And he specifically said, this kind goes not out, but by prayer and fasting. Now, turn to Mark chapter 9. There's a little bit more verses here to, to, in order to get the whole story. Mark chapter 9, verse 17 one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. What does that mean? Couldn't speak. Again, when somebody can't speak, is that because they have a devil in them? No. Um, in verse 18, And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth, gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. Means he's probably not eating, probably not drinking. He's pining away. That devil is having a very serious negative effect on that 
young man's body. It is literally just destroying his body. And he said, and I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out. And they could not. He answereth him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him. Why? The spirit knew he was standing in the presence of the Son of God. And he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming. And he asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. And oftentimes it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Straightway the father of the child cried and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Look at this. He's not just filling out a request like at the DMV. This man, this is his son. He's crying his eyes out for his son. I can't. It's hard for me to see what this is doing to my child. Will you do something? And he said, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Look at this guy. I like him. Because earlier, Jesus said, if you just have faith as a grain of mustard. Which is how much faith? Not much. Joyce Myers, that whole crowd will tell you, Joel Osteen will tell you that if you have Negative thoughts, that prohibits God from doing anything. I don't buy that. Some say you can't have any doubt whatsoever. And then when God doesn't immediately jump to your rescue, they would say of you, oh, there must have been some doubt in your mind. Look, I don't know how it works with you. But my faith and my Bible and my trust in my God is based largely in part on the fact that I do have doubts. The doubts cause me to do and react how this man reacted. Lord, help my unbelief. I, I believe you, but if there's anything about me that's not trusting you, not relying on you, help me. I mean, you've probably heard stories where Parents or maybe people would not go see doctors, not go have anything to do with the world's medicine, saying, we believe God's going to heal him. And all of a sudden the child dies. Does that help the child? Does that help you as far as family services goes? They'll take your kids away for that. Okay? And people have used that as an excuse not to seek out any medical treatment of any kind for their own loved ones. Now, does God, in his word, prohibit medicine, technology, x-rays, surgery? Does God, anywhere in his word, prohibit any of that? The answer is no. Okay? And if it's not expressly forbidden in the scriptures, it's not a sin. It's not a crime against God. But that's how some people are taught that God won't heal him because you took him to a doctor. Well, let me give you an example. There's a woman had an issue of blood for 12 years. What did she do first? She sought out doctors. And why did she stop seeking out doctors? She ran out of money. She put out everything that she had going to doctors and doctors weren't able to fix her body, her issue of blood. When she went to Jesus, did Jesus yell at her? Did he say, I'm not healing you because you didn't come to me first? Is that how he treated her? No. He loved her. In fact, he didn't even do anything. The Bible said that issue, that virtue issued forth out of him, and he knew it when the woman touched the hem of his garment. The hem of his garment, I think, is related to what you see in Revelation 19. Jesus comes back. He has his name written on his thigh, the word of God. And his garment, his vesture is what? Dipped in blood. I think it's the blood. Amen? So, but Jesus did not refuse to heal her in any way because she had already been to doctors. That's a lie. So this man 
He's gone to his, I'm sure he's probably gone to specialists, but I'm sure he's gone to doctors. It doesn't say that, but he's gone to his disciples. They couldn't do anything about it. So he goes to Jesus. And again, Jesus does not upbraid him. He does not condemn him. He just simply goes to Jesus and Jesus says, lots of things can be done if you'll believe. He said, I do believe, but help me in areas of my unbelief. And so he says, um, back in Mark, verse 25, when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead insomuch that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. And when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. So we have two witnesses. Out of the mouth of two witnesses or three, let every word be established. So now this is an established doctrine in the Bible. This is something that I would say, if you don't believe this, you're probably borderline calling God a liar. And the man that I met in southern Missouri a few years ago, who heard that I was going to be teaching about the King James, and he came and chewed me out afterward. And he said, your King James is full of errors, and we have better manuscripts. And I said, oh, you mean the manuscripts that take out prayer and fasting? And he said, oh, no. He said, I mean the King James that they added prayer and fasting against God's word. And I went, I never heard anybody say it that bold. He knew what he was talking about. He was just dead wrong. And he accused the King James translators of adding this doctrine to the Bible. And I said, you mean you don't believe in that? He said, not on your life. And I said, well, I'm not going to stand here all night and argue with you. And you can either come tomorrow night and hear me out or stay at home. But I'm going to preach on this thing tomorrow night. The next night I preached um, probably uh, the case for a pure Bible. And I think he was there. I just don't, he didn't stay around afterward and talk to me. But that's what he actually believed. He believed that our King James had errors in it and that they had added this doctrine. Now, it's just like the difference between the vine of Christ and the vine of, vine of Sodom. And Moses said, our enemies themselves being our judges. In other words, the people who are on the other side of this issue, they agree with us on this one issue that our Bible and their Bible is not the same Bible. So you have to decide which one you're going to trust, which one you're going to believe. You're going to believe the one that took out prayer and fasting. Or you're going to believe the one that has it in there. The one, and I mean the one doctrine that specifically identifies that there are stubborn spirits that can only be removed this certain way. Meaning that if they're not removed this certain way, they're not going to be removed. Okay? That's what we're looking at. And it's no wonder that some people's lives are the way they are, or maybe your life was the way it was at one time. Because God was waiting for prayer and fasting and it never happened or didn't happen in a timely way. So we have those two examples, again, taken out of all of the, all of the Greek Bibles. All, and that means every translation of the New Testament, in no matter what language, whether it's Spanish, Italian, Chinese, Japanese, Swahili, doesn't matter what translation it is, because they removed it out of the Greek text, then they have thus removed it out of those translations. So that only leaves you, in today's modern world, that only leaves you with one translation, the King James, and any other language translation that comes from the same manuscripts as King James comes from. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. So you've got all these churches around the world who don't believe in prayer and fasting to get rid of these devils. And is it any wonder that you can go to these churches and you're going to find probably those devils inside those churches? Amen? Now, 
Turn to Isaiah 58. Primary purpose for fasting. And again, some of the things I said a few months ago, a few weeks ago, I sort of remember how I laid some of this out. And some things I just, you know, wanted, I want to say at the beginning and I'll give you scripture for why I believe what I believe. I've gone without food before. Um, primarily to lose weight. Um, I don't have a problem with you fasting. If you want to fast every now and then, and if you think that helps, you know, with weight issues or that helps with, uh, you know, medical issues or whatever, I'm all for that. I'm not against it whatsoever. Uh, fact is, we here in America, I don't know what they do to foods nowadays, but they sure make us fat very quick. Okay? And... Um, so I probably, our diet here in this country is loaded with fat, loaded with sugar, loaded with salt, loaded with all kinds of things that are probably not good for you. So to remove yourself from eating nonstop, you want to eat, not eat for a whole day, not eat for a couple days if you can handle that or whatever, I'm fine with that. But it's not the same as if you're going to set aside a day to pray and fast. That is a, and I keep this in mind, here again, we're, we're setting the ritualism out of the way. If you've got an issue that you think is serious enough, serious enough to pray and fast, then pick a day where you're not going to work, pick a day where you're not going to the store, pick a day where you're not going to a friend's house, pick a day when you're not going to watch TV, pick a day when there's nothing else going on in your life so you can spend that day doing what God said to do during that day. Okay? Uh, I don't recommend prayer and fasting go to work. Okay? If you have a very, uh, if you have a job that's very tasking on your body, you're going to need nourishment for that job. I don't recommend it. Okay? Because the devil's going to use that job to talk you out of it. Okay? If you're going to pray and fast, pray and fast very little, if anything else, that day. Because this is a day that you're setting aside between you and God. God, you're going to talk to God and be ready for God to talk back. Okay? So remove as much of the world's distractions out if you can. And again, I'm going to give you scripture reason why I believe what I believe. And again, when you get into the ritualism and you say, well, I pray and fast every week. Um, are you really praying and fasting in God's way? Or is that just a ritual that you got into that you do every week and you think it makes you look spiritual? And again, I would stay away from that. Primary purpose for fasting, Isaiah 58, 5. God said, is it such a fast that I have chosen? Here it is. This is God's version of it. And by the way, other religions fast. Ramadan. What is that? That's 40 days of fasting. They don't fast 24 hours, 40 hours. They fast from sunup to sundown, and then they eat at night. But that's Muslims. They fast for 40 days. Big deal. They're not closer to God because they fast. Uh, Buddhist. Um, Hindu. In fact, there's a whole sect of Hinduism. They're called ascetics. And believe it or not, they literally eat two grains of rice a day and they do this for a year because they believe that starving and nearly mortifying their body is a way to reach God or the gods. Okay? Buddha tried that. At one time in his life, he was uh, an Indian prince, had everything, had all kinds of stuff. And he decided that asceticism was the way to go. And he about nearly starved himself to death and he couldn't reach God that way. So he gave it up. But just because you don't eat doesn't mean that you're getting closer to God. This is doing it God's way. Let God choose the fast. Number one, a day for a man to afflict his soul. That's the primary purpose of it. It is affliction of your soul therefore it's not a day for joy riding it's not a day for visiting neighbors and family and having to play in bingo all day it's not a day for that 
this is between you and God, and I would keep it as much to yourself as possible. Can you fast with other people? Sure you can. Okay? Sure you can. It can be done. I'm just saying, this is a day of affliction. It's not, it's not a happy fun day. Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and that, and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? I mean, think about it. The uncomfortableness of sackcloth. That's what it's meant for. But thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord. Is God in this fast? Is God in it? God may not say, God may say, you know, I'm just not, I'm not in it today. Um, seek the Lord on it. To, and then he says, is not this the fast that I have chosen? He said in verse 6, to loose the bands of wickedness. That's one purpose. So ask yourself the question, has sin got a hold of me? To undo heavy burdens. Have, have I been sorrowful? Am I burdened down with things? Am I worried about things? Uh, to let the oppressed go free. What is it? This man was told by Jesus, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Now, one of the things that I think is different in those two stories, Christ's disciples couldn't do it without prayer and fasting. But did Jesus pray and fast? Doesn't seem like it. And why? He's God. Devils obey God. Don't, don't, that charismatic stuff doesn't go with me. They say that devils don't have to obey God, that God lost his dominion and authority over the earth when Adam sinned. That's a lie. They do exactly. Go read Job chapter 1 and 2. Satan did exactly what God allowed him to do and no more than what God allowed him to do. No more than that. So if, when Jesus told that devil to let him go, that devil let him go. Oh, he had a little party on him first, but he let him go. Because he knew the consequences for not. Those that, the man that was possessed by legion knew the consequences for dealing with Jesus. You could get thrown in the pit for this. And they were not ready for that. I think it's funny they ended up there anyway. Uh, to undo every burden, to let the oppressed go free. So you could be praying for somebody else. And that you break every yoke. And he's talking about yokes of bondage or being, watch this, unequally yoked with other people. You find yourself being in friendships that you ought not be in. Maybe, uh, maybe some good looking boy is winking his eye at you and, and oh, he's so daddy, he's so cute. And Daddy's going to shoot him if he comes near the house, okay? But maybe he's not for you and you just, you say, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know that I have the strength to run him off. Let God do it. Okay, let God do it. But we get ourselves in yokes of bondage and we find out that we can't easily get back out of them as easily as we got into them. God can let us free. And he said, uh, verse 7, is, not, is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry when thou, that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked that thou cover him, that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. So there's a whole list of here, things here that God qualifies our conditions for which we, that this, this would be the reason God would call a day of fasting and praying. Many examples in our nation's history of our leaders, from the president on down, to call a day of prayer and fasting. And I believe Obama bypassed all of those days, and Trump's called for them. Amen? Uh, probably wouldn't hurt to pray and fast for the president one day as long as God's in it because can you imagine the bondage that they try to tie him up in the bondage the yokes the threats that they try to get to him with they've threatened his own son Baron threatened him okay uh, who is that lady comedian has got a image of Trump's head where she got a bloody knife in it like she cut his head off she should be arrested for that okay Kathy Griffith but anyway so these this is a list of things that God would call a fast for now do you see in here 
where you need money, or you want money, or you want a new car, or you want a new diamond ring, or whatever. You want two houses, want one at the lake and whatever. You see anything like that here? No, it's not important enough. This is not something you would cry to God over. God, I can't live without this. I need that two cars. Okay? God just laughs. So don't call God for something like that. If God blesses you with that, that's fine. But don't act like you can't live without it. So there's the list there. How long to fast? Luke chapter 4. Well, the Bible gives us many examples. Luke chapter 4. And here's the thing. Where the Spirit of Christ is, there's liberty. And I can tell you that there's not any place in the Bible where God says, okay, now if you're fasting and praying for your own sins, that's going to be three days. If you're fasting for somebody else's sins, that's only a day. There's nothing in the Bible that says that. Okay, what I'm going to give you are examples in the Bible of what they did, what other people did. Okay, Luke chapter 4 verse 1, Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. Now, um... Physiologically, the human body, that's about the limit. As far as human body is concerned, going without nourishment, going without food of any kind, if you make it to 40 days, you've really accomplished something and you don't have too many days left in this world. If, you're, if you fasted 40 days and you think you're going to try to make it 50, you may not live. Okay, The body's limit once your body runs out of fat to eat, it'll start eating tissue, start eating muscle, bone tissue. It'll start eating itself, feeding on itself. It'll start taking things from your body to keep the vital organs alive. And then at some point, you will just merely starve to death. It'll get to a point of there's no return. Somebody who's not eaten in 40 days cannot be returned back to food just like like if, you were, like if you miss lunch, so you're going to eat a big supper. You can't do this. It'll, it'll probably kill you. Somebody that's been a magician, I used to see David Blaine. He went, I don't know how many days without food, locked up in a box for a big stunt. And um, when they got him down for that, they had to reintroduce foods back to him <coughs> very slowly or would have killed him. 40 days, like I say, is about enough. Now, I've heard people brag about fasting 40 days, going without food, and going without water for 40 days. I don't believe that. I don't believe it. You can go about three days without water. Then your body's going to start breaking down very, very quickly. And I don't recommend that. And again, uh, You'd be surprised that what some people will try in thinking that their performance is going to please God enough to get God's attention. And again, I want to add this. Let me, let me give you a story that I, a, a person that I knew several years ago, it was a pastor's wife. He had asked me to come out and preach a revival for him, so I did. I didn't know that him and his wife had been having some problems his wife grew up in a broken home he didn't he had a very big family very loving family in fact he lived next to his mom and dad and, and some of his sisters and uh, but his wife grew up in a broken home her mother divorced her, divorced her dad when she was young and she struggled with that and then her mother became an instant follower of Joyce Meyer that didn't help things any so she had a constant diet as a young girl, she had a constant diet of, your dad doesn't love you, but, and you've got to work really hard to get God happy with you because God hates you all the time and you think negative thoughts, that's why God doesn't do anything good for you. And so, I didn't know this going into the revival meeting. He sat me down one day and he said, my wife and I need to talk to you. And I said, okay. And he told me the situation. And he said that one Sunday morning, 
during the song service, his wife jumped up to the stage, I think, took the microphone away from him and took over the service in a free will Baptist church, knowing that you don't do that. And he said she got up there and she started putting guilt trips on everybody. How come this church isn't spiritual? How come this church never sees revival? How come this church doesn't do this? How come you people don't praise God? How come you don't worship God when you sing? So she goes around laying hands on everybody in the church and she's trying to make a big show. And of course, her husband, what are you going to do? I mean, the right thing would be, honey, sit down. But you're married to her. Where are you going to spend the night tonight? Okay? So he just kind of lets this thing go on for a while and then very gingerly gets the microphone away from his wife's hand. They close service and go home. Big problem. And I'm, man, I don't know how I counseled her with this, but it just dawned on me. I said, can I, can I be honest with you? And he said, yeah. And I said, you've been fed this thing all your life that you have to please God in order for God to do anything for you. And I said, that service was not, it had nothing to do with you pleasing God. Um, or, or with worshiping God. It had everything to do with worshiping you because what you think is that you must perform high enough and to whatever degree enough in order to get God to release some sort of emotional rush to you to where you feel accepted with God. And I say, you, if I have to ask you, do you believe the Bible? You would say yes, but the truth is you don't. Because if you believed it, you know that you're already accepted in the beloved. You already are. If you're saved, you're already in with God. And I said, you're trying to elevate and promote works of the flesh to those people and to yourself because you think God will release this feeling of acceptance with you and you'll feel like you're loved and accepted with God. And that's your problem. It's not the church's fault. It's not your husband's fault. It's not anybody's fault but yours. Because you refuse to believe simply what God said in His Word. That He already loves you. He already accepts you. He has already forgiven you. And every day that you wake up, you had revival. And I found out after I left that he took her to another pastor I know. Same issue. She, I could tell that she struggled with wanting God to accept her, believing from Joyce Meyer that God wouldn't accept her unless she felt the right emotions. Has anybody ever believed that before? I have. It's like if I feel enough emotions from God, then I know God loves me. Okay? But God tells you every day in His Word that He does... But you don't accept that for some reason. You need more. And then you think that you must promote your flesh and the things that you do in order to get that from God because that's what she was taught. And again, this is not about you putting on a show for God to show God how much you can deny yourself. God does not tell you that. That it's a big contest. But... If you feel like you need to fast four days, then I would fast four days. The most I've ever gone is three. Okay? So no time limit does God give in the Word. Does, he never says, this must last four days, this must last ten days, this must last twenty days. Never says anything like that in the Bible. And it's not a contest. I'm not even going to ask any who, who's prayed and fasted. According to the Bible, who's prayed and fasted biblically? I'm not going to ask that because you're not supposed to tell. Acts 10.30, Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting until this hour. So we know that Cornelius fasted and prayed for four days, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. That was an angel. Now, can you show me any place in the Bible that says, if you pray and fast four days, angels will come and visit you? No, nothing in the Bible tells you that specifically. It just tells you, this is what happened. I don't care if angels come and visit me or not. I prayed and fasted until God released me from it. Then, after a while, a few weeks later, when I 
Still wasn't satisfied. I went back to God one more day. Then God began to work. Okay, that's the only explanation I have. Acts, 20, Acts 27, 33. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the 14th day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Now again, that's two weeks. That's a fortnight. That's a long time. Did they drink? Probably. Probably. Now, could God have sustained them? Yes. We know that Elijah was fed. Is it Elijah or Elisha? Elijah was fed by ravens, and he continued 40 days in the strength of that one meal. We know that was a supernatural thing that God did, and God is fully welcome to do that again. Because you know what I think? I think fasting may come upon all of us one day. When we don't have anything to eat, and God says, why don't you pray for a day and ask me? Maybe I'll, see, maybe I'll send some bird food over your way. Okay? Uh, one more verse, 1 Samuel 31, 13. And they took their bones, buried them under a tree at Jabesh, and fasted seven days. So we have 40 days, 4 days, 14 days, 7 days. Uh, and then Jeremiah 36 Therefore go thou and read in the roll which thou hast written from my mouth the words of the Lord in the ears of the people in the Lord's house upon the fasting day. Also thou shalt read them in the ears of all Judah that came out of their cities. One day. One day. Okay. Now, most of us will probably never fast 14 days, 40 days, 4 days. But I think it's safe to say 7 days that probably most of us, if not all, maybe some have a medical issue, but probably everybody could go a day without eating. Okay? Now on the 20 and 4th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting, with sackcloths and earth upon them. So we have two witnesses in the Bible, these two verses that tell us that fasting could be as much as a day. Okay? And again... No scripture anywhere telling you for this item here, you must fast this days and take no water for these issues here. It's only a day. Nothing in there like that. Okay. That's one of those things. God will have to lay it on your heart. Now, um, I've told this before, but when God dealt with me, um, I had made up my mind and it, I didn't just come to this one day and said, I'm going to fast for three days. I told God that God had been building up to it and I gave it probably several days worth of thought. I probably put it, knowing me, I probably put it off. Ah, wait. And finally, when I couldn't wait anymore, God had brought me to the point to where I willingly, of my own free will, said, I am going to refrain from food from sunup to sundown until God moves, until God does something or gives me an answer of some kind, that's what I'm going to do. And I don't remember if my wife even asked me, how long are you going to do this? I don't think she did. If she did, I don't remember it. But I just took it a day at a time. And the next day I felt like I'm going to do this again tomorrow. And the next day, and I literally put everything else aside. Didn't do anything else but that. So uh, keep that in mind. Several time links given in the Bible. None of them are absolutely mandatory. Seek the Lord in it. Follow him. And then don't make a big show out of it. Because if you do, we all know why you're doing it. You're making a big show. You want everybody to know what you did. Okay? So when the guy said he fasted and prayed 40 days without eating or drinking any water, I think he's lying through his teeth. I absolutely do. Okay? And he was kind of the guy that said God gave him dreams and visions after that. 
and none of the dreams and visions have ever come to pass, and that's been like 40 years. 